We're at the Museum of Broadcast Communications in Chicago, and we're privileged to have a man who is uh, really a legend in, in the, uh, the radio broadcast era. He is uh, a man who has been involved in broadcasting for, I would say, possibly conservatively 60 years. He's Hyman Brown, and we're glad to have you with us today. I'm glad to be here, Chuck, because Chicago was almost my first stamping ground when I started in radio. Of course, I'm a New Yorker, and I had to broadcast from New York, which was my home. But I used Chicago, which was then in the late 20s, actually, and mm -hmm. the early 30s, one of the most important centers for radio, radio drama, radio, whatever radio was in those days, Chicago was as important as New York. There was no Los Angeles. That's right. There was no West Nothing. Coast. Mm -hmm. And then to see the decline that came with the advent of television was very disappointing to me. So anytime someone says, come to Chicago and talk, I'm more than happy to, <laughs> Chuck. Where did it all start for you? Was, it, was radio your first entry into show business, or did you do something before radio? I am a lawyer. I mm -hmm. finished my college at Brooklyn College, City College in New York City, where all of my education took place. And then I went to law school, and I became a lawyer. But I never practiced. I never once held a legal paper for a client in my life. It all began in my high school days when we had a little drama group, and then we had a declamation society at Boys High School in Brooklyn. Maybe some of your listeners come from New York Boys High School was the honor high school mm -hmm. in Brooklyn. You had to almost take a test to get in there. And uh, I was part of the debating club. I was always a speech maker. I was always a talker. And I always liked to be up in front of an audience. So this thing called radio was beginning in the middle 20s, 26, 27. We were making crystal sets. You'd go home and you'd get a little bo a box of some kind usually these were little containers in which you bought oatmeal. milk, <laughs> oatmeal, if you please. Mm -hmm. in, in, in Brooklyn and Brownsville, where I came from, uh, we used to get sour cream in these ah. containers. The guy would give you a measure of sour cream, and when Mama was through with it, you're supposed to reuse it, I grabbed it and wound the copper wires, mm -hmm. and you got a cat's whisker, and suddenly you were listening to Pittsburgh. You were suddenly getting something from Cleveland, something from New York City mm -hmm. itself. And that in, 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 b was an inspiration for me to say, why can't I be part of that? Why can't my friends at school listen to me? Why can't I go on and make noises and say words the way I do at the college or at the school, it was then high school, for this so-called radio audience? Mm -hmm. And that's how it began. I began as, I would say, an actor, but mostly as a reader. Uh, lots of poetry was being done in those days. Uh, David Ross uh, was the poet, and the, the organ would play, and poetry was read during the day, in the daytime, and then late at night. They didn't have enough to fill in. Mm -hmm. So all these small stations that were getting licensed all over the place were using people to read poetry. Actors, of course, but nobody really got more than two or three or four dollars. And that's where I went. I went to the local radio stations. There was the first station I touched was WRNY. Most of the hotels were getting licenses for radio stations. Uh, WRNY was the Roosevelt Hotel. Uh, mm -hmm. WPCH was the Park Central Hotel. WMCA was the McAlpin Hotel. WGBS was Gimbel Brothers, if you please. And... Uh, they had a hotel room. They would you take the bathroom, knock out the fixtures, and make that into a control <laughs> room. And I brazenly left, skipped class one day, and went up to uh, Madison Avenue in New York, where WRNY existed, and presented myself as an actor. I was a tall, gawky kid, in his early teen teenage kid, uh, who looked a little older, but I tried to impress them with the fact that I was here uh, waiting for a play to begin. And while the play was in process of being rewritten, wouldn't they like to have me read some poetry 
to the audiences that were theirs. And I didn't expect any fee. I didn't want anything. And I thought it would be great publicity for me. And, of course, they swallowed it. Don't ask me why. Maybe desperation on the their part. The price was right. <laughs> the price was right. And I must have been convincing because mm -hmm. after that I could sell almost anything. And once I went on the air once or twice on WRNY, I was an experienced radio <laughs> personality. <laughs> so I went to WMCA and I said, look, I've been on WRNY. You've got a bigger audience. Why don't I do it over? Well, I did it for about two or three months. And in the process of doing these readings, you read poems about courage and the poems about mother and only God can make a tree and that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, always poetry. And sometimes they played some music behind me, sometimes they didn't. But it was once a week, and it didn't amount to very much, except I could tell everybody to tune me in. And suddenly I was a big, big shot at high school. Uh, I then met actors. People came up and said, gee, you do that rather well. Or, what else do you do? And so on. I discovered that there was a thing called drama, radio drama. There wasn't very much happening in New York at the time. A man called Phillips Lord, of blessed memory, was doing some radio drama. And in the late 20s, a few shows uh, that were coming out of New York or regionally, out of, out of WLW, but I was not privy to them. I was a kid. I didn't know how to actually manage it. And they explained to me that there were networks, that suddenly uh, stations were getting together and there was a thing called the National Broadcasting Company. That was the one network. There was no CBS in 27 or 28. There was no Mutual. There was nothing. But the National Broadcasting Company, which was an offshoot of really AT&T, they had their studios down on Lower Broadway, which was the headquarters for AT&T, mm -hmm. uh, that they did some drama and that they, they gave auditions to actors. That's the first time I heard the word audition. Mm -hmm. So I called in to a woman called Margaret Cuthbert. These names are implanted in my <laughs> mind. There were a lot of mm -hmm. women mm -hmm. very responsibly positioned in radio in those days, in communications. Bertha Brainard, not a man called Royal, who was the CEO. Bertha Brainard ran the National Broadcasting Company. Margaret Cuthbert was everything, a casting director, a director of drama, whatever. And they gave me an appointment to come in one morning around 11 o'clock on a Saturday, fortunately, so I didn't have to skip class, and do uh, my audition. And I checked around, and an audition in those days meant that the actor walked in with about three minutes, and he would do 15 seconds of uh, British ac accent and uh, 10 seconds of an Italian accent and uh, do a Northeasterner and do a Midwesterner and do a gangster and wh whatever. You prepared all this material uh -huh. from snippets of plays, of, of, of books that you may have read, or stuff that you wrote yourself. So here I come in on a Saturday morning, and this austere woman is sitting on the other side of the glass. And she says, go ahead, young man. And I start. I do my accents. I try to do real classic drama. I try to do comedy. And about two minutes into everything, she is by this time completely distraught with me, and I I'm done. And she says, thank you. <laughs> Don't call us. We'll call you. <laughs> and I'm on my way out, and I take one desperate stab, and I say, but Miss Cuthbert, I do something which I was kind of shy about doing. I do Jewish dialect. She says, Jewish dialect, as if it didn't mean anything to her. Uh, I said, yes, let me try something for you because I'm a big fan of a man called Milt Gross. Milt Gross, in those days, had a syndicated column, a syndicated piece uh, for the New York World, uh, which was a big newspaper in the middle 20s. And it was a thing called Nice Baby, N-I-Z-E-B-E-B-Y. And Mama would tell mm -hmm. a fairy tale to the little baby, eat up all the cornflakes, baby, and mom will tell you about Little Red Riding Hook and the big <laughs> bad wolf. Take another sip, yes. Uh, his stuff was very funny and very good, and she said, okay, let me hear what you can do with it. And I read about 30 seconds, and her face lit up, 
And I read another 30 seconds, and out she comes from the room, and she says, you know, this would be tremendous, these fairy tales, read with this dialect for New York City, where we have a predominance of a Jewish audience, uh, on Saturday mornings. Can you come and do this around uh, 10, 11, 12 o'clock, once a week mm -hmm. for 15 minutes? I said, of course I can. I've got all these pieces from the newspaper. <laughs> I'll come. Gladly. She said the fee, uh, uh, maybe $5. I said, that's not important. I want to get on with this. I love the dialect. Uh, she said, I assume you have the rights. I said, what's rights? <laughs> I didn't have the rights. Mm -hmm. I didn't know Milk Gross from a hole in the wall. And they weren't going to put anything on that was copyrighted. Well, it took me two and a half months to pester and hound and knock at Milk Gross's door. They, all the cartoonists, he was a cartoonist primarily with a flair for this kind of mm -hmm. comedy because mm -hmm. he had to have a comedy sense to do the cartoons he did. Some of our great comic writers are cartoonists. I went to his office with my books and my knee pants, literally, and he threw me out once, he threw me out. I finally, in desperation, he said, look, kid, because all the cartoonists were around, they were getting sick and tired of me. He said, I tell you what, I'll give you the right to use this for three months for free. But after that, they got to pay. Now, you have all this old material. It's in the archives here. They're in the old newspapers. He, I said, don't worry. I got plenty to do for three months. Oh, my God. I can go on. I only can do one, one or two of your little stories, or three maybe, in a 15-minute slot. So I went on one week, and it did pretty good. The second hmm. week I'm on, telephone rings. By this time... NBC had moved to 711 Fifth Avenue. They had left AT&T downtown, and they were on 7th Avenue, on 5th Avenue and 55th Street. And the phone rings, and a page comes in, and he says, there's somebody on the phone wants to talk to you when you get off, as, you get, as you're getting off the air. And I go on to the phone, and a voice says to me, this is Gertrude Berg, and I live in the Bronx on Mount Morris Avenue, and I've been listening to you. Your Jewish dialect is delicious and wonderful, and I love Jewish dialect because I do it myself. My father owns a hotel in the Catskill Mountains, and I've been writing entertainments for Saturday nights for him, and I do takeoffs on the people that come there, the Jewish women and their families and their homes and how they live all year round, and this is a holiday mm -hmm. for them. Uh, I would like to meet with you. I said, fine. I'm, can you come up to Mount Morris Avenue in the Bronx? I said, the subway runs there. It was only five cents. <laughs> I met Gertrude mm -hmm. Berg in 1928. She was a big, heavy woman, considerably, oh, well, at least 13 to 15 years older than I was. And she presented me with something called the rise of Molly Goldberg. And she said, look, there's a father here, there's a mother, I'm the mother, you'll be the father because you can affect, you seem to be able to deal with your voice. You can become an older man and you could be my husband and you have a dialect and we would play together. You will write, I will write the scripts and you will go out and try to sell them. If you got on the air with NBC, you'll get on the air maybe with something different. And sure enough, it took me about a year, till the end of 1929. Meantime, she's writing more episodes, and it became the Goldbergs rather than Molly Goldberg, mm -hmm. because I wanted some recognition. And I still have my original agreement with her, in which she would write and play Molly, I would play Jake and sell, and between the two of us, we'd hire the extra actors and pay for everything. And I finally got to NBC, and they uh, went through a whole process for months and months and months. They said, we'll put you on once a week for 15 minutes. The fee was $75. By then, they could afford $75 for the whole 15 everything, minutes. For everything. That meant I had to hire, there were two children in the, in the mm -hmm. drama, in the story each week. I had to hire uh, the two, two youngsters who had to play that. And there were always one or two or three other actors. So I was dealing with four or five actors. The announcer came with the, with the time, and the music came with the time. Mm. They had a string quartet playing some Italian melody that pleased her, and I didn't know what the heck it had to do with me, or with the Goldbergs. But uh, we were left with maybe, I don't know, 
uh, I think I got about $15 out of it, and she got about mm -hmm. $15 out of it. But it caught on. And after three or four months, the gleam in her eye was all Gertrude Berg. What did she need with this kid from Brooklyn who did all the dirty mm -hmm. work and who was a minor? My parents were not my guardians in any sense. My father was in the dress business and my mother was a homemaker. What did they know about it? They didn't even know yeah. I was doing this because I had to be at school. I had to be helping my father in the shop with whatever problems he had. I did his bookkeeping and all that sort of thing. So she said, get lost. I said, but I got a piece of paper. It says here we're partners. Uh, I knew enough mm -hmm. to have drawn. She said, well, you know what you can do with that piece of paper. You're a minor. Uh, you had no guardians. It has no value. Well, I still have the paper, and I still have a letter which says, herewith, $250, which is a quit claim, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I had a trauma the like of which I've never experienced in my life after that. This betrayal by this sweet, loving, all-bosomy mother <laughs> who embraced everyone's problems was the most treacherous thing that could have happened to me. I went into a tailspin. Fortunately, some of the teachers I had at school, I was just about entering Brooklyn College and I was doing a combined five-year course in my academic degree and my law degree. They did it in those days. Mm -hmm. Today you can still do it, but it takes about seven years. Uh, they made me realize that perhaps cutting the umbilical cord, perhaps getting away from a woman as vicious and as cruel as she obviously was to me and later turned out to be to anyone who touched her. She was a howling success, but she was. You know nothing about her husband. You know nothing about her children. And she left a trail of blood. She's long been dead, and I don't speak with any fondness or with any caring for this woman. And I've done a great deal for endless people in my life. This vindictiveness, which still is in my bloodstream, will remain, I suppose, for the rest of my life. She should not have done this to someone who started a career that netted her millions. Fortunately, by cutting the umbilical, I was able to get rid of her mm -hmm. because everyone else who touched her, it's like the old story of the, the young man who was walking in the community with a duck and everybody that touched the duck stuck to, and, and pretty soon there were 20 people stuck to each other. It's a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. uh, these people that she started, many of them came to a bad end because they could not have a career. She destroyed their careers. She created the characters and hounded them so that she, they couldn't do very much more. The only man who ever succeeded beyond me with having had a contact with her was a man called Everett Sloan. You must, mm -hmm. in all of your old-time radio dramas, yes. he was a part of Orson Welles' yeah. company. Mm -hmm. Everett was my dearest and closest friend. I was with him two weeks before he committed suicide. Um, I then went on and figured, well, if I can sell one dialect series, it's called The Rise of the Goldbergs, and then subsequently for television, mm -hmm. it was called The Goldbergs, yes. mm -hmm. uh, I can do another one. And sure enough, one of her dearest and closest friends, I don't know if she's still alive, it's been years since I've talked to her, her name was Burns, Julie Burns. We decided between us we were going to do something called the Bronx Marriage Bureau. Now you can <laughs> see what that is very quickly. That was the old matchmaker, matchmaker thing, yes, of yes. course, and uh, I would be the matchmaker, Mara Shapiro, she would be my wife, and between us, we settled the fates of dozens and dozens of marry, young marrieds and older mm -hmm. marrieds. It was a good framework for human interest storytelling, a very good framework. And I went out, and having sold one with a bit of a reputation, I wound up at a company that's national now called Goodman's. Goodman's Matzos and Goodman's Noodles now and Goodman's Spaghetti. They, they make all those products. But in those days, in, in the early, early 30s, with the Depression, with everything going on, they made only Matzos for the Passover season. And I convinced the president of the company, a man called Eric Cohn, who was the dearest man and the toughest guy I ever worked for, 
that he should go on before the Passover holidays with it three times a week, three fifteen minutes a week. I got it, I got a deal with W O R for the whole package. He paid me, then I bought the time from them. Mm -hmm. All of that was permissible. I was a kid. How I all managed that, I don't know. And we went on with the Broncos. We did a match each week for 13 oh. weeks. And that lasted for three years. Wow. Now, oh. with the success of oh, now I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a <laughs> broadcaster, even though I only was on for 13 weeks. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I tried to be an actor. And I auditioned for Fred Allen. In 32, and I immediately, oh, all these voices, all these trick dialects. But I had to run out. I, I, I'm skipping because because of the Bronx Marriage Viewer, another incredible thing happened to me in 32. Uh, so incredible that it's the basis of my whole life. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't make rehearsals. So he said, look, kid, either you're an actor or you're a producer <laughs> or a director. So I had to leave wonderful, wonderful people like uh, Parker Fenley and, and, oh, Charlie Cantor and uh, then Teddy Bergman, who mm. then became Alan uh, Reed. Reed and so Was on. Minerva Pius with uh, oh, Fred sure. at that Minnie, time? Oh, Well, <coughs> that's how I got to Fred Allen. Mm -hmm. Minnie Pius was, was, was Milt Gross's best friend. Oh. And she said... Uh, because of my doing the nice baby things, I met many through Milk Gross. He became like my father. He became a paternal figure in my life. He was very devoted mm -hmm. to me right till he would tell the stories about this kid with the school books and the knee pants not letting go of him. And Incidentally, uh, after the 13 weeks uh, of uh, Milk Gross's material, did you start paying him for that? No, there, we went off the air. There was no <laughs> money. <laughs> that, but it, by that time, I'd had 13 weeks under done my belt. To, for and yourself, and I, yeah. I was knocking around with the mm -hmm. Goldbergs. Okay. But I was still in school. Mm -hmm. I was still taking my classes. Mm -hmm. I still had my father's business on my back and so on. So all of this uh, fit in with a, with a complete uh, picture of, of, of ne never being able to rest, really. Mm -hmm. But what happened... Uh, the Goldbergs went, uh, went on their merry way and then uh, they got client interest and then became a five time a week mm -hmm. show whatever I took that completely out of my system except to look at what her income was becoming and saying my goodness what I would have done with that kind of money in the early 30s because I got married in 33 mm -hmm. and immediately I had kids I was a, 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 young, a baby really but I believed in family and in a home, and I, I, I just didn't want to know about the Goldbergs anymore, what with the so-called success of the Bronx marriage mm -hmm. people. What happened, happened here in Chicago. This was really the birthplace of my success. I, two things happened. There was a company, an advertising agency called Blackett, Sample, and Hummert in those days, a very important agency, mm -hmm. which today is Dancer Fitzgerald Sample. Mrs. Ann Ashenhurst was then the head of their radio department. Their ra they were using radios for... Mm -hmm. I have letters dated 1930, 31 from Campbell Soup, from Procter & Gamble, saying we are not considering radio as an advertising medium. <laughs> Therefore, we hope you have success wherever you are going, but we're not interested in your ideas for programming. She and the clients of Blackett, Sample, and Hummett, she was working on a thing called daytime drama. Not soap operas, if mm -hmm. you please, but daytime dramas. And suddenly, the agency had gotten New York clients uh, and uh, a, a position in the New York advertising marketplace along with Young Rubicam and McCann Erickson and Ruth Ruff and Ryan and so on. Uh, Leo Burnett always remained in a Chicago agency but with branches in New York. But Blackett, Sample, and Hummett began to make New York almost its home base, as was proven as the years went by. And she showed up. She came to New York, Mrs. Ashenhurst. And I sent a letter to her saying that I was a producer, that I had done the Goldbergs, that I was doing Bronx Marriage Bureau, and that I was ready to serve her as a producer, as a director. By this time, I, f I was directing the shows. I was casting the... If I did the Bronx Marriage Bureau, who knew better what 
the actors yes. had to be and so on. And I'd gotten an acquaintanceship around from people of, in, in the industry, and I was paying $5, $7. In 1932, they could pay their rent with that. Yeah. So uh, I came home. I was still at home. I wasn't married in 32, And uh, the phone rang, and my mother answered, forget it. Uh, because in my letterhead, I had a phone number, uh, hoping that I might be there to answer the phone. Gee, <laughs> no, no great knowledge of English. And uh, couldn't make head or tail of someone called Mrs. Ashenhurst. I came home, and there was a telegram, a Western Union, please be at my office at 2.30 Park Avenue. I memorized it. Tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, I would like to interview you. Signed, Anne Ashenhurst. And you can bet I was there. And that was the beginning of my soap opera career. In 1932-33, one of the very first... Well, Chicago was doing things like Merton Marge and Little Off and Annie. These were nighttime shows. Yes. I'm talking about doing a series at 2 o'clock in the afternoon of a romantic daytime serial. No soap opera. My client, she discussed the series with me which then became a reality. You may remember it as a, as a historian. Marie, the Little French Princess. That was for Louis Philippe Lipstick, which was a Chicago affiliated drug product, and Louis Philippe uh, Rouge, all, all of, uh, and there was another product, Angelus Rouge, Angelus Cold Cream, or whatever. Uh, some of your listeners Absolutely may Absolutely targeting to the audience of women at home. At home mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. daytime yes. mm -hmm. and a romantic series. And the saga of Marie, the little French princess, is really one for the books. Uh, I would like to tell it to you, but I'm not letting you say anything. Oh, I'm, we're here to talk with you and let you talk. We're not talking. Work. I'm just <laughs> giving you a this living is, history. This is great. I, we need to take a break for just a second. So if you can stick around, uh, we'll, uh, we'll continue our conversation, our monologue, uh, which is wonderful, with Hyman Brown, a producer, director, actor, writer, a man who um, added a lot of gold to the golden days of radio. Stick around and don't touch that dial. Our guest is producer, writer, director Hyman Brown. He is a, uh, a man who has been so much involved with radio. In fact, he said to me while we were taking a short break that he may be the only living person from that period of time with which he's speaking. Well, possible? we go back to the middle 20s, and the only man that I relate to from the 30s would be Norman Corwin, mm -hmm. and he came in around 37, 38, or 39. That would be 10 years after I had had my first exposure to this thing called radio. No, most of the people I knew, Chuck, are not with us anymore. Uh, some of the actors are still mm -hmm. around, mm -hmm. and they're very dear and very special for me. Uh, a lot of the actors that I used came out of Chicago, but they came in the 40s after the war. People like Sam Wanamaker and Charlotte Holland and Donna Michi. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, Donna Michi is, is Chicago. Uh, Mr. First Nighter, yes. if you remember, mm -hmm. and I recently worked with him. I did a series of 26 half-hour radio shows. I'm getting off my history. Uh, 26 radio shows for Voice of America, uh, where he was my host. I was chairman of a special radio advisory uh, committee uh -huh. about three years ago, and this was a series of 26 dramas for the bicentennial of the Constitution, which I did for Chief Justice Berger. They were the uh, uh, cases which made history over the years. We're, we're constantly worrying about landmark cases. Everything you read today, the landmark case has been done, has been uh, overturned, or new landmark cases are being established. But I went back to John Jay and went through yeah. 26 cases that brought us up to, like, the Miranda case. And Don Amici was my host. He's incredible. My memory is that Don worked for me in the 50s in New York. I did a series, again reminiscing, for NBC called the NBC Morning Matinee mm. from 11 to 12, 1956 to 1960. That was the death knell. That was the end of radio drama. Yeah. Uh, I went on five days a week. Monday, Madeline Carroll. Tuesday, Don Amici. Wednesday, Celeste Holm. 
Thursday, Eddie Albert, and Friday, Lee Bowman. And we did a different drama each week. Not a series. Uh, each five one. Different five different uh -huh. stories, but not series, because uh, Madeline Carroll would do stories that would fit her particular uh -huh. romantic image in the British background. And the same thing for Celeste Holmes. She would play n new women, new executives, uh, uh, newspaper reporters, cops, and, the, and of course, uh, Donna Michi. He could play almost anything. But we tried to slot all these people into a to their pattern. personality. Yeah, uh -huh. exactly. And uh, uh, I hadn't seen Don for the longest while, but Don Amici could take any piece of dialogue, any script, cold, and he would never fluff. He would never make a mistake. <laughs> this man was like iron, rock of Gibraltar acting. He was wonderful. And he did these uh, introductions and the closeouts for me on the 26 shows I did. And he was so happy. And I hope, I hope in the future, when the museum here gets into its new quarters, maybe, maybe we can do some real live drama, not 1930s style, not 1940s style. Some new time radio. New time radio, which mm -hmm. is now. Right. Remember, dialogue, we don't speak the same way in 1991 that we That's spoke right. in 1935. Mm -hmm. Our expression of speech, our idiom, our manner of speaking, our relationships are so different, and yet the old-time things, are f for what they are, are there. They're, they're nostalgia. Mm -hmm. But they don't really have the wallop and the entertainment, even when they do a play in New York, like they're doing a play about the 40s, they still make it as if the idiom and as if the expression and everything that goes with it is 1990. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remember, we don't have prop airplanes. We don't have Model T Fords. Uh, even the thunderstorm sound. All of our sounds, <laughs> we make sound now, mm -hmm. digital sound. We go out with Nagaras and Ewers and create sounds that never existed with the perfection, the quality of what you're getting in the 30s and 40s is nothing to compare to what I can get in a studio today, what you're getting with me right now on contemporary equipment. You try to play back something in the way of an interview with Ed Murrow or people like that mm -hmm. in the middle 30s, the quality is different. And I hope that the museum will be able to offer your listeners and others around Chicago living radio drama, live radio drama, the spoken word. I have a foundation dedicated yes. mm -hmm. to the spoken mm -hmm. word. And more and more we're getting the spoken word. More and more people are reacting to readings, to people talking to each other, not on interviews in the sense of call-ins, but doing mm -hmm. drama uh, as, as a reading. And radio drama takes your imagination, in, embraces the listener like nothing else in the history of theater. But let me get back. Well, we were talking about the little princess, right? The Marie, the Marie. little French princess, was my first <laughs> exposure to this wonderful, wonderful woman, Anne Ashenhurst. She was a m dynamic lady filled with stories, filled with ideas, for this world of the woman at home during the day and this is how we're going to sell cosmetics and soap and all of the food products that the woman goes out to buy in the uh, shopping marts. There were no supermarkets in those days to speak of. Yes, it was A and P, I suppose. But uh, she, detailed, she was impressed with all that I had said, that I had done all these shows uh, and that I was able to cast them and direct. And she asked me, would I produce something which she created? Would I be able to get a writer to do it? Would I be able to then direct it, produce it, cast it, get the music, do whatever had to be done? And I just said, of course. I'd never done anything mm -hmm. on that kind of a basis. But nothing daunted me. And she told me about Marie, the little French princess, which was going to go on for Angelus Rouge and Louis Philippe Lipstick both Chicago companies, and the agency was basically uh, hired as a Chicago agency, but she wanted to do it with New York production techniques and New York actors. We still had some of the best actors. They were coming from Chicago to New York, 
And so Marie was the princess of a little Graustarkian uh, country, kingdom. Uh, remember, it's 1932, 33. Mm -hmm. We're in the depths of the Depression. Escapism is the word. Uh, the audiences had to believe that there was another way of life besides the selling apples on street corners yes, and uh -huh. going. Roosevelt wasn't even still in yet. We had nothing like the WPA, nothing. Uh, that's what I'd be talking about w yesterday and uh, I spoke this afternoon mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with Studs Terkel about that period as a social force. Radio could be a tremendous social force in those days, as we have proven for the people who came to the uh, workshop that we've had these two days here. I took Marie, who hated her royalty and hated people bowing and scraping and all the things that she had that the people in her kingdom didn't have, and she ran. She wanted to come to America, which was more democratic, and she wanted to be one of the people, so to speak. And she soon discovered after three months, uh, I'm now getting into the story as we develop it, <laughs> that you couldn't get into America unless you had a mm -hmm. visa, unless you were part of the quota. And she had none of that, and she wasn't about to get it until some of the people who loved her told her that if she married an American, she then would have the proper credentials to come to America. And so she met Jimmy, and Jimmy was played by an actor called James Meehan. Uh, James Meehan was the nephew of Thomas Meehan, who was then a very, very important movie star. Mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy married Marie, whom he loved dearly, but it was a marriage of convenience. It was a marriage to get her in to America, but of course they fell madly in love. And here she came to America. And of course, for three years, three and a half years, Jimmy never knew she was a princess. Everybody else knew she was a princess. Doors were <laughs> opening and closing. Bombs were going off. Shots were being fired. People were trying to kidnap her. There were all kinds of intrigues going on. But poor, sappy Jimmy never knew that his dear, dear Marie was just <laughs> what she was. <laughs> and at the end of three and a half years, I went to Anne Ashenhurst, and I said, Mrs. Ashenhurst, I've run the gamut. I don't know how we can keep this from him any longer. It's three and a half years, five <laughs> days a week. How stupid can he be? Well, she says, you know, the minute, the minute we uh, tell him she's a princess and the minute that intrigue and that mystery is gone, we'll be off the air, Hyman. I said, so we'll be off the air. We'll do something else. And sure enough, she said, go ahead. It's three and a half years. We revealed, and the plot then took about three months, and we were off the air. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, she had become very, very dear and very important to me. And with her, there immediately followed a series called David Harem. Then I did John's Other Wife, which was another very important daytime serial. And because of David Harem, uh, came way down east, and a whole series of soap operas. By that time... I think in 37 or 38, Procter & Gamble was in the picture. Lever Brothers mm -hmm. was in the picture. Colgate was in the picture. And that's how they, they, they called it the soap, soap operas yeah. because uh, mm -hmm. that's why horse operas were called westerns because of the horses. But here it was the sponsors that made them soap operas. But along with Mrs. Hummert in 32, 33, came a whole parallel evolution which governed my next 50 years, my whole life. At the same time that I was meeting Mrs. Hummert, I ran into a group of men in New York who were also advertising and selling proprietary drugs. And uh, they felt that to sell a certain kind of candy, which was a uh, weight involvement, as a matter of fact, Mrs. Hummert at that time was advertising a product called Jad Salts. You took these every morning and you lost a pound a day. They were nothing mm. more than high-class laxatives. They drained <laughs> your body of fluids and all sorts mm -hmm. of things. And she <laughs> had me do a series three nights a week called Jack Dempsey's Gymnasium. At that time, it was the big, big thing was the Schmeling bear fights. Mm. And Jack Dempsey, who was kind of a semi-retirement, set a drama up in which we were in at night... In the evening, in the early evening, that's when these programs went on three times a week, we were 
privy to the development of fighting and the development of the lives of the fighters and Schmeling went on and, and somehow I made a story out of a documentary we made a mm -hmm. document it was mm -hmm. one of the very first pioneering type of stories of the time and these guys that were selling Jad Zolds said what would you be able to do for some kind of an adult audience that would be uh, cops and robbers that was the way I termed it. I said, what would happen if I went to Chicago and tried to get the rights from the Chicago Tribune the Daily News Syndicate for Dick Tracy? Oh, that would be wonderful. We could test it. And so I went, came to Chicago, met a man called Arthur Crawford, who's long gone. A wonderful, wonderful, sleep, sweet guy. Chicago Tribune building. I remember going up there. It was the first time I had taken the 20th Century Limited. There were no airplanes really going to Chicago that meant anything. And mm -hmm. I bought the rights from Chester Gould. I have correspondence from Chester Gould that is history, commending mm -hmm. me on what I was doing and so on. And uh, I went to Boston to test Dick Tracy. Calling all cars, calling all cars. Dick Tracy is on the air and the cars, the siren mm -hmm. screeching and the announcer coming on with Jad Schultz Presents. The actors in Boston, I give back to you. But even the signature, I had to get a kind of metallic uh, filter effect. They didn't know what I was talking about. They didn't know anything about sound effects. To get a siren in 1932-33, the police department said to me, we won't give you a siren, and don't you dare buy a siren. It's going to say <laughs> something. Well, I didn't listen to them. I went to the fire department, and I didn't tell them what I wanted. I wanted a siren that would start and stop and that I could control, I would rent it from them. So they happily rented me a siren and I had to put it out in the fire well in where the studios were, whatever, some hotel of BB, WBZ, WBZA. And the, we could get the siren going, but I could never shut it off. <laughs> the overtones and the till it wound down would intrude on the commercial and the client complained by I have no other way if you don't want me to use the siren I won't use the siren well in 13 weeks we sold a tremendous amount of Jad Souls and a lot of people liked Dick Tracy and by this time Dick Tracy had much more importance than for Jad Souls and I came to New York with it all of these things were going on simultaneously mm -hmm. by this mm -hmm. time I was already out of law school I was 33, 34 and I was married, and uh, I, I was so involved and so busy and making a fair sum of money for those days. Um, I brought it to New York, and Quaker Oats bought it. And that was my first announcer was Dan Seymour. Oh, yeah. Then he went on to become the CEO of J. Walter Thompson. But Danny Seymour was my first announcer, and Quaker Oats then wanted to go on at 5 o'clock across the country. Well, at 5 o'clock, in New York, it was 2 o'clock, they went on for children. Mm -hmm. the, the interesting, strange thing was that although we went on to sell Jad Salts, the kids picked the show up. The kids loved. I never really did a children's program for children. I did an adult program for children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You never play down to kids. Don't ever dare do that. So that they loved Dick Tracy because there was Dick Tracy Jr., there was... Pat, who was a funny guy, and so on. Uh, and uh, by the time we were off testing, I don't know, ran for about a year in Boston, three times a week, I'd commute between New York and Boston. It was a wow. hectic time. Yeah. But when you're that age, you can do anything. Uh, by that time, uh, we had a huge kid audience. And I went on NBC at 5 o'clock with Quaker Oats for a limited audience. I started to say that 5 o'clock was 2 o'clock in... California. Mm -hmm. So we would pre-record the shows. I had written ahead so far so that at, at uh, 2 o'clock, we weren't on at 2 o'clock. We only played regionally and we sent records out, platters. Mm -hmm. That was the, first, yeah. the beginning of, of, of acetates. We recorded on wax in 1937. Oh, yeah. Remember, but we pressed on acetates and they went out to the station so that Five o'clock was five o'clock across the country. Quaker Oats stayed with me for about seven, eight years, as did Danny Seymour, and it was very interesting. We recorded, the pre-recorded 
at night because everybody was busy and they could come at five o'clock and maybe rehearse for an hour before but I did five Dick Tracy's in three and a half four hours from about eleven o'clock at night until two o'clock three o'clock in the morning it was that was the only time I had was it always was it recorded across the country then it was no we sent we, we sent platters I think we were we were on at five o'clock in Chicago mm-hmm. we were on at five o'clock mountain time they got platters ahead of time. But it was live in New York and the yes. East Coast. Uh-huh. We never, but you, that live business was something that some sponsors drove me up the wall with. You remember, live from New York, yeah. live from Hollywood, live from Chicago. I'd go on with Inner Sanctum Mysteries at uh, 8.30 to 9 o'clock Sunday night in New York. And we'd have to come back at 12.30 to do the West Coast version. Mm-hmm. Uh, not version, West Coast broadcast. So the announcer could say, live from New York. And let me tell you, between 9 o'clock when we went off for New York and 12.30, a lot of my actors had a pretty good time. <laughs> Didn't always get the same show. But uh, that's what they wanted mm-hmm. in those days. But Dick Tracy went on the air for Quaker Oats. But... Mrs. Hummert then kept me alive. Another development at that time was a company called Blue Coal. They were an eastern company only, and they sold coal, which they sprayed with this blue dye so that they'd have some kind of uh, identification away from the other coal companies. Mm -hmm. They, Ruth, Roth, and Ryan was the agency. They were a big Chicago agency. Ruth, Ralph, and Ryan. They came. They saw I was doing all these shows. Some friend or somebody sent me up there. Somebody said, go up and see the account executive. Mm -hmm. And I sold them a series. You showed me a picture earlier called Little Italy. I figured if the Goldbergs and the Bronx Marriage Bureau worked with a Jewish dialect, why not Italian dialect? Mm -hmm. New York was a big, big location for Italian families, Italian immigration. So I created Little Italy and I played Dominic, the father of the family and had a whole slew of relatives. And we did three nights, three times a week for a series for about 26 weeks because, again, they only sold coal at certain times of the year. <laughs> so you, you loaded up on coal in, in uh, uh, the springtime so you would have it and through the summer months for the fall mm-hmm. when the winter time be ready and they, strangely enough they sold it to the women this program was directed to a woman's audience Little Italy was uh, designed to attract female listeners I don't remember now maybe somebody out there will remember for me exactly what time I went on the air but Little Italy then led they figured they got to change the programs all the time mm-hmm. then I did a series called Peggy's Doctor now, you know all the doctor series, yes. mm-hmm. but I said, why not do the doctor's wife? Again, appealing to the women's mm-hmm. audience. What is it to be a doctor's wife? She was privy to all of his phone calls in the middle of the night. Mrs. Mm-hmm. So-and-so is giving birth, or the kid has a croup, or somebody's dying. And from the woman's point of view, it was very successful for at least a year. And then again, they said, well, uh, we, we want to change. And that next change... I was not privileged to. Somebody sold them a series which they, the agency, I think, had maybe changed. I don't know. But they said, let's appeal to a, a broader audience, to a male audience. And that's how the shadow happened. Blue Coal was the first mm-hmm. sponsor. And my dear friend Orson Welles played the shadow. I worked with, again, coming back to Chicago, 1932-33. When I worked with the Gump, with, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, I worked so successfully with Dick Tracy, uh, Corn Products Refining Company. They had an agency, uh, I forget the name of the agency, they wanted to go on the air, and they bought a half hour from CBS, again in the daytime, to appeal to a woman's audience, mm-hmm. and put Orson Welles on reading poetry for one fifteen minutes, and somehow it's too va- lengthy to, to d- detail. They got to me and they said, we want a little comedy vignette series. About that time, Vic and Sade were going, I think Lum and Abner, the idea of a husband and wife and a family, mm-hmm. but in a lighter comic vein. And I thought immediately of the Gumps. The Gumps were part of the Chicago Tribune Daily News Syndicate. And so I went again to Arthur Crawford 
and I bought the gumps. And I was still at school, still at college, and my classmate, there was a man in the English class sitting next to me. I didn't know who could write comedy for me. Mm -hmm. It was a very... Each one had to be a vignette. It was way ahead of its time. It's the kind of thing that Woody Allen and a lot of the comics yes, today uh -huh. do. It was ten minutes worth, because the rest of the time were commercials and identification. And I uh, said to this chum of mine who sat next to me in the English class, maybe you can do all of this. You could write these little vignettes. You're very good at short stories. You're doing very well. Everybody here loves you and so on. His name was Erwin Shaw, ah. the very important mm -hmm. writer. Mm -hmm. He wrote the gums for two, three years for me. And Min Gump, I had to cast Min Gump, and I don't like auditions. I talk to actors, and my insides tell me whether or not yes. they will mm -hmm. work. And Min Gump, the first job she ever got in New York in 33, she'd come from Ohio, a school teacher who wanted to break into theater, was a lady called Agnes Moorhead. And that's how my life mm -hmm. began with Agnes mm -hmm. Moorhead. The rest of the cast, uh, Chester Gump was a, a man who's still around. Jackie Kelk, he was a, a child actor. They went on to become a very important executive in advertising and so on. But all these people who had their beginnings with me a lot of them are still alive, although the executives that I work with are not. And the Gumps happened, and they ran for about this. So I was running Dick Tracy, I was running the Gumps, I was running Blue Coal, I was doing the soap operas for Mrs. Hummett, and uh, I was the proverbial one-armed paper hanger, but <laughs> having the time of my life. It must have been a fascinating time. You, you, you've done so much, and you did so much at that time. You had, how, how did you did you have any time with your wife and your family? Well, it, it, uh, being a student of psychiatry, being a, I, I, I'll explain to you with all the doctor series I did, uh, I had time for my family, yes, because mm -hmm. everything was in New York. I had no office. I worked out of my home. I didn't need an office. I was never in an office to do all these. To do, can you imagine doing four 15 minute shows a day at least? Five days a week. Yeah. I was always on with the Sunday shows, I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, I, I didn't know. Yes, my, my children will tell you now, and I've got very, as a matter of fact, I've got grandchildren and so on. Uh, they will tell you that. Uh, their relationship to me was through their, my radio programs. <laughs> my, my, my son would get, I have to bring home the Dick Tracy scripts, and he would sell them at school for five <laughs> cents apiece. They had a very strong relationship mm -hmm. with my work, which in a sense was not the kind of relationship that a father family should have. Mm -hmm. I imagine in retrospect that I was maybe a little derelict in my complete attention to home and family. But then again, I was married for 27 years before my wife contracted cancer and so on. I don't want to go into mm -hmm. that for your audience. But, uh, yes, I, <laughs> when Inner Sanctum Mysteries went on the air, I was attacked by every child study group in the United States. You're scaring your children, and they're, they're, they're frightened to death, and they're doing this and doing that, just the way you get today. All the child study groups attacked me, and listener groups. And Inner Sanctum was a howling, smashing success, and I wasn't about to go off the air. Uh, so what I did was create my own psychiatric group that said, this is good for children. And we used my son. Uh, I said, Barry, and he would tell the story, on, uh, I had it on, on a tape, that uh, he would listen to mystery, to uh, Inner Sanctum Mysteries, and that, yes, Daddy, I had bad dreams sometimes, but... I didn't get up until I dreamed them out good. <laughs> well, it was, it was an interesting time. But I did have not the greatest relationships in retrospect again, but both my children are with me now, and both of my grandchildren are with me, and uh, we have a very, very happy relationship. It's wonderful. You were talking about Inner Sanctum, and I want to talk about Inner Sanctum and uh, the Thin Man and Bulldog Drummond and some of the other great... Uh, Grand Central uh, Grand Station. Grand Central Station. And, of course, the CBS Radio Mystery, Mystery Theater. Theater. Well, that was radio today. I'm very proud that I could have come back in 74 and for 10 years, 9 years, br brought radio into 
this this century, so to speak. This was contemporary. The stories were about women executives, about women killers. The stories were about contemporary uh, world as the contemporary world as we know it, not something that existed in the Depression and in the war years. So many of your stories relate to the war effort yes. and to the, uh, let us live in the 90s, not in the 30s. Okay, we're going to talk about all of that in just a moment. Chuck Shaden here with uh, Hyman Brown, a very prolific uh, radio guy. Don't touch that dial. Our guest is Hyman Brown, a producer and director and a writer and an actor from the radio days, uh, all the radio days from uh, the uh, late 1920s even to the 1990s. Uh, yes, I'm still producing, Chuck, mm -hmm. and still doing radio, uh, mostly in New York City. But only recently, uh, I was chairman for a very special radio committee for the Voice of America. And for them, on their English service, I produced and directed and created. You forgot to use the word create. Yeah. Everything yeah. I have put on was pretty much my own creation or my putting together. I created 78 half-hour shows for the English service, which didn't cost the VO, VOA a penny. I had it funded by outside sources, mm -hmm. which I was very happily able to do. And uh, they were done for overseas, and then I got a waiver from Congress to use them domestically because what is broadcast by VOA is not allowed to be broadcast in the States. Mm -hmm. The networks made sure of that when the law was passed for VOA. Oh, I see. Well, they didn't want competition yes. from the VOA broadcasting news, etc., etc., but since there was uh, a commonality in drama, they permitted me, and I put them on. I put 26 and then 26 more of the 78 on public national public radio, and, and they were very successful. These were stories about? Uh, well, the first 26 were called Americans All. These were stories which I said would take the Bill of Rights and show mm -hmm. that only in America could you have a Truman, a LaGuardia, uh, a George Washington Carver, if you please, mm -hmm. uh, an Edgar Allan Poe. We, I picked 26 Americans, some very well known, some not so well known, who made it because we are a democracy, because we do have a Bill of Rights. My host was Charlton Heston, and I got waivers from the Union so that it could be produced for literally pennies. The Smith Richardson Foundation, they're the people who manufacture mm -hmm. Vicks chemicals. They gave me, together with my own foundation, I have two foundations, Chuck, devoted to the spoken word. One is called, strangely enough, the Radio Drama Network that had never been copyrighted. Uh -huh. And uh, I'd still produce. And the actors are legion who want to do it. All of the uh, new actor, new younger uh, breed and uh, repertoire of people all want to be part of the spoken word. They're all over the place. There are readings going on at community wise, at community centers, at colleges, schools of communication, schools of theater. They all go in for readings. And I just saw in the New York Times and probably here too an announcement that the Reader's Digest Foundation, that's the Lila Atchison Reader's Digest Foundation, mm -hmm. just granted, I don't know who, and I can't find out who, $3 million for a six-year program where authors will be reading from their books at WISE throughout the country. Mm. What I could do with $3 million in radio, oh, boy. I and could how many on. more people you could reach, too. Oh, mm -hmm. countless Yet again, you and I have been speaking about the new breed of executive that has to dole out these funds or is in charge of this kind of money. They're all in their 30s, 30, maybe early 40s, and you can't reach them. I walk in, and I'm in my 70s, and my hair is gray, and uh, although I have the energy of a 45-year-old, it just doesn't reach them. They have their own ideas and they have their own little cliques and clacks I suppose the way I had when I was struggling mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. striving and they stay with them but 
just to hear some of these authors read. Some of these authors can't read beans. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what will happen, but even six years, that's $500,000 a year. I could be on the air five nights a week with fresh... I could take their stories and dramatize That's right, them you could. Mm -hmm. And do mm -hmm. them justice. Because, uh, and as you said, oh, I know now I can give you a 200 stations uh, with, with one day, two days, three days of phone calls that will say anything you send us, hi, we will put mm -hmm. on the air. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly getting phone calls. How do we get your material? And I'm not about to go into the business of selling a... A program for 25 or 50 dollars or whatever uh, the going rate is I just refuse to do that I think our economy our communication system should tolerate and support radio drama well this is basically the reason the revival of the mystery theater was only about 15 months, is that That's correct? That's all, and mm -hmm. after 12 months I said, get me off the air, because mm -hmm. I was paying actors rerun fees, I mm -hmm. was paying actors, writers, replay rights, I was paying for directors, replay mm -hmm. rights. None of that happens with old-time radio. The people who are selling old-time radio to the stations are bootlegging all the stuff. I say this with deep regret, and perhaps you may not particularly relish my saying it because you're not privy to that you're paying for what you get from the people who are selling you the programs they have no right really to do these things without considering the guilds and the replay rights in television and in films oh the unions are, are, are getting tremendous amounts mm -hmm. of sums for the little actors I'm not talking about the million dollar Schwarzeneggers who make their own deals but for the little guys to whom a few hundred dollars a month is the difference yes, between yes. their pension and their social security and existing because nobody wants to hire them they're too old it's a different marketplace out there so well, I, I hope that you can you will be successful soon in creating something new uh, some what we can call new time radio for the listener of today who is looking for something more on radio than what is on the air today regularly as far as news and music and talk. I know I have your blessing mm -hmm. and I know I have the blessing of your counterparts throughout the United mm -hmm. States. What I need is your equal at the advertising agencies. Mm -hmm. I can deliver two to three hundred stations that are important stations like BBM and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, WLW, K, W, -W, -K -Y -W uh, top stations, WABC in New York. I can deliver two, at least 200 stations. All of public radio would go with mm -hmm. me uh, at a cost that is negligible compared to what they're spending now for a one-minute radio spot. A one-minute radio spot, network-wise, runs about a thousand dollars. If I do a one-hour show, I've got eight to ten one-minute spots. If I sold out, it would be eight thousand to ten thousand dollars. There's a, a whole lot of money there. You don't need mm -hmm. that kind of money to produce. Oh, I need pennies to produce, literally, because of my own backing, my own foundation. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to you. You don't pay me. I come because I want to share a yeah. lifetime uh -huh. with people who care about the spoken word. I've done this for the last 20 years. As a matter of fact, I've done it all my life, but I haven't really done it on a level of education. I have worked for the community continuously, absolutely free of charge. I just made, I, I'm sure you'll be hearing them, a series of one-minute radio spots for the libraries of America. Mm -hmm. I did this mm -hmm. for Frank Stanton, the magnificent man who was really CBS, and a man called Andrew Heiskell, who was the CEO of Time uh -huh. Life for many, many, many years. Uh, I didn't cost them a nickel. I did a series of eight one-minute radio spots very recently to give a job to a senior citizen with actors, with everything that went with them, the writing, the production, the voices, all contributed, free of charge. That's great. This isn't 
pro bono, that you're not paying for something. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely because it is a public service of the first order. I believe in that, and I believe in what I'm doing. And somewheres, the foundational setup that I have, plus somebody at a Reader's Digest, somebody at the CBS uh, Foundation, they have all kinds of money, but they give it to ballet groups. They give it to theater groups. Somehow, the people at CBS say to me, we can't give it to broadcasters. Something in their charter, which is kind of silly and <laughs> short-sighted, yeah, yeah. but you don't argue with these mm -hmm. people. You, who has the time or the energy to really bat their brains in? But it will happen. It has to happen. I have seen in the last two, three years this growing trend towards what I call, again, I'm repetitious, the spoken word, yes. uh, readings. Playwrights have written plays now. There was a very successful playwright uh, who is still running all over the country, but he ran with great success where a man and a woman, a male actor and a female actor, and important ones, big shot actors, read their letters to each other, one to the other. Mm -hmm. uh, very successful. Love letters, letters of which explain and expose their feelings and their love for each other and their sentiments and so on. But each week they changed the two actors. Each week you had two other stars and you couldn't get tickets. They ran till they ran out of actors in a sense yeah. mm -hmm. for about four months. Now it's playing all over. You got it in L.A., you got it here in Chicago. And the colleges are bringing in people who read. That's what the Reader's Digest Fund is going to be able to do. Uh, some of these writers have glorified opinions of what they're worth more power to them. <laughs> but in the contracts now, when Mr. Doctorow makes a contract, contract with either Simon Schuster or whatever, they are reading on cassettes their books. And now you pick an ad up and Walden Books and Barnes and & Noble and, and yeah. uh, Dalton oh, Books, they're words. selling two cassettes, which runs maybe an hour for 14.95. I don't know how that breaks up. I know that the booksellers get half. Uh, so for seven and a half dollars, uh, Random House is in business. I don't know how many are being sold either. Nobody can find out. I don't know what the return situation is. But the authors are all vain enough to want to read their own works. Some of it's great, some of it's pretty awful. And I've heard them read. Uh, they don't do justice. They're better with the printed word than mm -hmm. they are mm -hmm. with their own histrionic talents. But it's becoming more and more, and this gives me hope that the drama will come back into its own. We live cyclically, and cyclically it will come back. I only hope that I'm given the years to go forward with all of this, because it, it's a cinch for me to produce. I recently produced, I created recently a series which only is for the 90s called We the Living. These are 26 half-hour dramas about people over 60, 65. Mm -hmm. If you've seen Driving Miss Daisy, yes. which was a mm -hmm. fabulous success, I have 26 half-hour Driving Miss Daisies. These mm -hmm. are stories, they're wonderful stories about people, their problems, their lives. What happens after... You've got one television series called The Golden Girls, mm -hmm. and it's a boring, salacious half hour about sex after 65. That's all it is, these women making bad sex jokes or trying to ply themselves with men friends or so on. There is room, and it's successful. There is room for drama. Now, these stories are not all down. The man who was kind of my mentor for this series. He read all of my scripts. It was a guy called James Behrens. He is the number one uh, man in the United States. He's 74. He is the authority on aging and all that goes with it. Uh, he said, I will not permit a single script to go through that hasn't a line of hope. No. So that no. every script has a line of hope. And they're incredible. Now, I produced six of them only a few months ago to live audiences at the Fashion Institute of Technology. 
a university, a state university mm -hmm. of New York. Mm -hmm. And three, four hundred people came to each. They were free because I'm funding myself. I paid for the scripts and I paid for the actors and the sound effects. And the reaction was tremendous. I have those six tapes already, which then can be broadcast. But I won't go forward with six tapes. I will only go forward with 26 tapes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I want radio to become a habit. And that's what I spoke of when I said seven nights a week. You are now working seven nights a week. You cannot just go on hapstance. It's got to be a continuing well, thing. The listener <clears throat> has to know where it is and that it's there all the time. You know that right. the third mm -hmm. service in Great Britain, BBC, has mm -hmm. a third service, mm -hmm. which is devoted completely to drama and the spoken word, poetry, readings. A complete service that's only the spoken word. We That's paid for by the listeners. It's a licensee. Mm -hmm. We here, who are commercially oriented, nothing. Cable will never think in terms of... I have proposed, I don't know if your listeners or you remember, about 20 years ago, four actors went out on the road, and they played in New York for several months, and read... George Bernard Shaw's Don Juan in Hell. Agnes Moorhead, mm -hmm. Sir Cedric Hardwick, uh, Charles Boyer, and Tyrone Power. They stood at lecterns mm -hmm. in evening clothes and read. By the time they read it 20 times, they had it memorized. But they always had so-called scripts, yes, a mm -hmm. portfolio in front of them. I propose doing this for cable or for public radio, television, national public television. It would cost nothing more than like a radio show. Yes. An mm -hmm. actor is reading, and you get a, 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 a... The cost is minimal. And I have thousands of scripts. I could read 1,500 one-hour radio mysteries with just that kind of actor. And the sound effects are in the background. And you play with lights maybe a little bit so that you're focusing on actors. And you have a whole brand new experience. Nobody understands what I'm talking about. Nobody wants to even try it. New York, Channel 13, Dr. Baker, if you please, listened to me and uh, politely brushed me off to some mm. sub-level and they politely pointed to the exit door. He just had to let, I don't know how many people go. They don't want to know from saving any money. <coughs> And so, yeah. it's still an uphill fight. But your belief that it can happen, and your hope that it will happen, is mine also. Well, we together hope that it will happen, I, I think. And I'll be on WBBM when it does happen. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Talk about you as a creator of, of uh, radio material. Now, you created Inner Sanctum. From a blank sheet of paper, I guess. Well, a, it was more idea. than a blank sheet it? of paper. Uh, you see today, for instance, I just read a huge piece that Tales from the Crypt mm -hmm. and Tales from the Dark Side and so on, uh, how successful they are at HBO. Uh, I've always believed that mysteries and suspense, I always, well, with Dick mm -hmm. Tracy in 33, I was in the business of detective stories. Of, Dick Tracy started me off on this whole idea of an inner sanctum mystery. I had several doors which we always used. When you went into the police station, there was a different kind of door when they were breaking down a door mm -hmm. in a tenement. Or it was a different kind of door when they had the guys hooked in the basement of a building and they had to break a, a, a steel door or whatever. There was one door that I used whenever we were doing a mystery theme. We were going through a haunted house or we were going through some creaky place. This door creaked. It squeaked. No matter what we did, we could not make it function. And that door literally said to me, Hey, hi, make me a star. I can run a series <laughs> for you. Let me be the spokesman for you. Mm -hmm. And that's what literally happened. Tongue in cheek, smart aleck like. I said, I'm going to open that creaking door. That says more to me than the Ride of the Valkyrie played by uh, the Ch Chicago Philharmonic 
<laughs> 200 musicians. And I created the creaking door. That's what it was called. And the door opened, and this anomalous, unknown voice said, Come in. Welcome. I dare you to sit on that tombstone. <laughs> and it was that tongue-in-cheek kind of uh, coast-to-coast coast, uh, it was, it was a ghost-to-ghost -ghost network. I'm forgetting my own gags. But the authors relished these kind of corny jokes about mystery and mystery themes. And uh, I did an audition of it. And as luck would have it, I created Grand Central Station. Let's say the signature with the train coming yes. in. Oh, yeah. That's all out of my head because the trains that come into Grand Central Station are diesels and you wouldn't know that you were coming in on a train. It had no excitement. So I said, what do I care? The Santa Fe is going <laughs> to come into Grand Central. And every week we got hundreds of letters. Grand Central is not. The, the, you're doing a train that would never go under Park Avenue, all that malarkey. But I did for about eight, nine years. I stayed with Grand Central about three years, four years. I couldn't take the agency executive, and I got out of it. <laughs> but that's what led me to create another half-hour mm -hmm. series at the same time. And... The sponsors for Grand Central Station, which is the point of my retelling this, were Lambert Pharmaceutical. They make Listerine. Mm -hmm. And the company that was interested in going on the air was Carter's Products. They made Carter's, the liver pills, and Arid Underarm Deodorant, and Mole Shaving Cream. And, of course, as executives existed in those days, the guy from Listerine and the uh, CEO from... Uh, Carters lived together and played golf together and Harry Hoyt who was the head of Carters said to the head of Listerine uh, I want to do the same kind of thing you're doing Grand Central Station is selling a lot of product for you it's very successful people love those half hour dramas who's doing it for you and he named the agency and named me as the producer and the next thing you know I've got a phone call from a Harry Hoyt to please come down to their offices way downtown tiny little offices. They were not that big, but the products were interesting. And uh, they would like to listen to what I had to offer. In those days, you took some auditions under your arm and you went to an agency or a client. Clients bought their own time. Mm -hmm. The station didn't make you take a spot on whatever program. You bought your own time. And so Carter's the Deliver Pills had bought a half hour on radio and that in itself is something to wonder at NBC wouldn't sell a laxative company anytime couldn't advertise the <laughs> laxative thinking of what we advertise on television yes, today yeah. just think that in 1940 you couldn't buy time to sell a laxative well as luck would have it NBC was forced by the FCC to split so you got the red network and the blue network in 39 or 40. And the blue network was WJZ and the red network was WEAF. The blue network was headed by a man of blessed memory again, Edgar Kobach. And he said, what do you mean we can't advertise like this? I need the business. We'll mm -hmm. take you, Mr. Hoyt, and we'll take whatever you bring to us. So I spent three hours with Mr. Hoyt and I played for him first I played for him Bulldog Drummond I had the rights to mm -hmm. Bulldog Drummond and he thought I was too British and it wouldn't appeal to Topeka, Kansas or Lubbock, Texas or whatever his reasons he didn't like the British accent of my leading actor uh -huh. then I played for him a thing called dress rehearsal I figured that if First Nighter was that successful and you were going to a premiere First Night wouldn't exist without dress <laughs> rehearsal. That was more exciting to hear the dress rehearsal than to go to the first night. Now, uh, first night is there already, and this is like a kind of uh, step child to... Then, as a last resource, I pulled out the creaking door. And he went absolutely insane over the whole humor of these ghosts and whatnot. And my first episode, my first complete story, it was a very, very strange, tongue-in-cheek again episode. He wants to buy it. 
But he said, I'm right there in, in, the, in the three hours. He said, I love it, but I, what kind of a title is the creaking door? Especially, he said, we want to sell Carter's Little Liver Pills, and y you're thinking of doors to, to, to bathrooms. I, I, <laughs> whatever it was, it bugged him. He said, I need another name. And sure enough, in 1940, I was a subscriber to the New Yorker magazine, and at the end of the magazine, they had a column which reviewed mysteries for that week or that mm -hmm. month, mm -hmm. and uh, they did, uh, mysteries were being published by the dozens. They always have been. Mystery clubs, mystery books, constantly. Mystery Writers mm -hmm. Guild, yes. the mm -hmm. ri Mystery Writers of America. And there was an ad that showed uh, a, a book, whatever, kind of an eerie ad, and it said, this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery by Simon & Schuster. They published a series of books called Inner Sanctum Mystery. Why, I don't know. So out of peak, I had been reading the thing going on downtown, so on the subways. I said, how would you like to title Inner Sanctum Mysteries? And he went for it. This meant that I was in the rights business again. I had to go out <laughs> again. But I, by this time, I was kind of experienced. I got the person who was completely in charge of mysteries at Simon & Schuster, a big company, and uh, made a deal where I had the right to use the words inner sanctum, and I, the end, would say, this month's inner sanctum mystery is. For that one-line plug, I, and that's how inner sanctum happened. Oh. We ran for about 14 years. So uh, the, the mystery... Uh the novels came had nothing before to do. the show. We sold the novels. Yeah. But, but we, sold we had nothing. Too. Oh, sure. Yeah. But we had nothing to do with the mm -hmm. novels. Mm -hmm. uh, their books, I had no rights to the books. I just had a right to this title, which literally the word inner sanctum could easily have, I could have appropriated them because yeah. it is a common denominator word. But I did the right thing by asking them for their permission, and that's how it happened. Then we went on for 14 years. An amazing run. Oh, yes. And one of the most amazing things about that show was, of course, that the, the host, Raymond, I guess initially it was uh, Raymond Edward Raymond Johnson. Raymond Edward Johnson. Mm -hmm. That's a saga unto itself. I liked Ray's voice, and under my tutelage, he would do exactly what I wanted him to do. I didn't want the shadow laugh. I didn't want any of that <laughs> business. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want him smart alecky. I wanted him to be kind of, look, you and I know that there is no such thing as ghosts. Mm -hmm. You and I know that all this is concocted from the whole cloth and that we're really doing this to give you a good time. Sure, we're scaring you, but there's kind of an entertainment fun to being scared. So share this with me. I'm not here to, to sell a product because I'm scaring you. I'm here to entertain you. That kind of, I, I'm, I'm overstating it. And he listened and he did it. And he did it well for about four or five weeks as your host of the Inner Sanctum. And suddenly I'm confronted by the guild, the AFTRA people are in there saying, everybody else is getting credit as our union contract calls for, so-and-so played so-and-so, and, -so and uh, what about credit for the host? I said, that's impossible. He's a disembodied voice to me. He's a wraith. He's, he's a voice that I created. He belongs to me. He's in my head and in my gut. Oh, we, uh, if you don't give him credit... I said, well, uh, you, you know, I'm a signatory and I'll go to court with you on this. I'll go to the AFL, wherever you... Well, back and forth, and by this time he had an agent, a new sponsor. We've been only on the air for two, three months. I didn't dare at my age start anything. So uh, I said, I'll settle with you. I don't want your whole name, Raymond Edward Johnson. That sounds so stuffy and it destroys my whole concept. You want to say, Raymond, your host? Okay. So we settled for that. It was a compromise because mm -hmm. he needed the money. And we ran for two years or two and a half years with Raymond, your host. Then he was drafted into the war. Uh -huh. When he was drafted into the war, I no more had Raymond. 
And if you go back through the files, Raymond, your host, went with him to the wars wherever he went. I put Paul McGrath in as your host. And at the end, he would say, maybe your host was Paul McGrath, but never at the beginning. And Paul mm -hmm. was with me for maybe 10, 11 years. Because when the war was over, and Raymond Edward Johnson came out, and remember, I kept him out of the war. He was a hale and healthy man because for two years because we said the entertainment value, the people at home are getting a great deal out of this because mm -hmm. we put war messages into the yes, show mm -hmm. and so on. Everybody was putting war messages, buy bonds and keep your mouth shut and uh, write to your boy and build victory gardens and so on. And uh, he uh, stayed out, but finally they did draft him. They told me to go fry my fish elsewhere. When he came out, I didn't see him, and we got him out earlier, too. He wrote me long letters, get me out. I, I'm not serving <laughs> in, in the armed forces at the front. I didn't see him. I saw an agent from the William Morris office, and they came in and said, well, now that he's back, these are the terms. I said, wait a minute. I created literally my own monster. I don't need him to tell me what my show needs. We're a smashing success. With Paul McGrath, I do owe him the job because he was there and he went to the wars. But I'm not paying him these astronomical cents and the terms he would dictate what he has to say and so forth and so on and so on. And that was the end of that. We're going to take a short break and yep. then we're going to wrap up our conversation with uh, Hyman Brown. Stick around. Don't go away. Our guest is Hyman Brown, who is a, uh, I guess you want to say a, a triple threat man. He's more than that. He's a quadruple or a quintuplet, I suppose, with uh, with all of the things he's done on uh, on radio over the years. We've had a wonderful chance to um, listen to him uh, reminisce about his career and to talk about the, the things that interest us so much, uh, past and present. He, of course, created that creaking door that opens so beautifully every week uh, of the inner sanctum. And that was a door that was also used the same in, for the Mystery for Theater. Mystery Theater, yes. Yeah. Now, you, you were talking about Bulldog Drummond, which oh, was yes. a popular movie uh, series. Oh, during the 30s, translated yes. Translated nicely to radio with Ned Weaver, I think. Was no, it? Ned was Dick Tracy. He was Dick Tracy. Yeah. My, my first Bulldog Drummond was a brilliant British actor by the name of George Colouris. Oh, George mm -hmm. Kalouris, who died recently, was the dearest, most wonderful man that ever lived. He came here at, because the war had broken out in 39 or 40, and uh, uh, somehow he came to America from the British government and whatnot, and he became part of the Orson Welles Stock Company, mm -hmm. uh, the Mercury Theater people. And one of the important actors there was Martin Gable, who then married... Uh, Get the name of the actress, but he died about six, seven years ago. Martin Gable. Arlene Francis. Arlene yes. Francis. You're absolutely right. Now, why should I block Arlene Francis? She worked for me in 37, 38 mm -hmm. for seven dollars a show. <laughs> uh, Marty, Marty, uh, his was one of the most brilliant narrators. Mm -hmm. His, he was second only to Orson Welles in narrating anything on radio. But his big problem was that he was like five foot one or five foot two, and we used to laugh, always too short for the part. He was, <laughs> his voice was brilliant. Mm -hmm. And he one day said to me, I think you're going to be working with Bulldog Drummond. Do you have an actor to play the part? I have a dear, wonderful man who's struggling here with, with Orson Welles. We don't have any parts for him. And he's, he's just, just right for you. Would you meet him? So that's how I met George Kalouris. And... George stayed with me until he had to go back to London. The war brought, when we went into the mm -hmm. war, he had to go back. And it was then that I cast Sir Cedric Hardwick for it. And Sir Cedric stayed with me for about four or five years because he was acting on Broadway or wherever he was. But he always had time. We could always record ahead of time and do things with him. But the big thing about Bulldog Drummond was the signature. That became a classic. I created these footsteps. The foghorns. The foghorns. What is London? The foghorns and Big Ben. 
and the footsteps which said out of the fog and out of the night into his American adventures mm -hmm. comes <laughs> Bulldog Drum. And I always used to laugh because Sir Cedric would say to me, it seems to me, Hyman, in his very British accent, it seems to me I'm being conked on the head every week <laughs> in the very same place to give you a curtain for the first act. <laughs> Dear man. You could really see, as a listener, you could really see uh, those, you could see him walking in the fog. That's I mean, what radio is all about. Fog. Absolutely. Yeah. I engage you, I identify mm. you, your imagination with all that's going on. Otherwise, what is the spoken word? What is radio? You have to do that. And if only the idiots, and I use the word advisedly, who run the buying and selling of television and radio time would only realize that the audience that I've engaged is more interested in his product mm -hmm. than they are almost in my show. That they're buyers, yeah. that they'll stay with him. No, they're only interested in ratings or whatever they can talk about at the Friars Club or at the Hollywood whatever and that's the end of me it's a it's an up, uphill battle it's an uphill battle. but a worthwhile battle. yeah absolutely and you get keep, to a point keep fighting oh I yeah. won't stop yeah. I can afford to indulge myself <laughs> and that's what I'm doing beautiful but the yeah. audience reaction is very heartening to come and sit and talk with you for instance for the length of time we spoke in your interest the audience mm -hmm. you catered to, mm -hmm. WBBM, who carried Mystery Theatre, yes. who was a CBS affiliate from almost the year one. They've been with CBS yeah. in the early 30s. Les Atlas, people like that, as important as WCAU, as important mm -hmm. as WCBS is today. It used to be WABC. Yes. How these letters have yeah. changed yeah. and fluctuated is beyond words. But it's, it's um, a very, very important part of theatre. Yes, if I can yes. leave nothing else with the people who have been listening, theater is wonderful. You've got a curtain. You've got a stage. You come there. You sit there with 800 more people. And you see what you see and you relate to your neighbor perhaps. Even now, they've done away with curtains. You walk into mm -hmm. a theater today mm -hmm. and the set is part of your audience because they want to engage mm -hmm. you as far as they can. Films, forget it. You're not going to go see Schwarzenegger and identify with the nonsense he's through or follow that car or the explosions mm -hmm. and whatnot. You'll identify with Driving Miss Daisy. But I'll make you identify with Driving Miss Daisy tenfold by giving you those people in your imagination. You'll see not Jessica Tandy or the actresses that have played in this on Broadway. Mm -hmm. You'll see your own Jessica Tandy, your mm -hmm. own... Daisy, who might be your neighbor or your grandmother or your great aunt or something. How much more exciting it is. Well, you become a participant with That's radio. That's right. You, it's not a spectator sport. No. It's, you are a participant. That's radio, right. You know. And I, I told you earlier that I gave his first job to a man like Irwin Shaw. Mm -hmm. For all of his life, he said, his novels were successful because he learned about writing dialogue. Mm -hmm. Dialogue sets the scene not long narratives. You set emotions by dialogue, not by long descriptive passages. Almost any good author will tell you that. And the people who are devoted... I had a completely different audience from the golden age when I went on in 73, 74. Yeah. Totally. How many hundreds of letters, people saying we came home and it was four minutes till the end of the mystery and I couldn't go in the house. The dinner was spoiled <laughs> yeah, and so yeah. on. Uh, people just devoured these mysteries and yet somehow can't get the advertisers to say this is what we want to do again. And I say to the advertisers through you and through WBBM we're talking pennies. We're not talking billions of dollars mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. spend and worry about whether it's CBS or ABC or whoever is in number one place. A 30-second commercial in the Super Bowl would, would keep Would pay me going. for two years. <laughs> it's That's something right. like, like yeah. $800,000. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. what I could, what could do. Yeah. And we reach huge audiences. Mm -hmm. I don't care how you multiply it. 
in that same period of yeah. time, I would reach millions and millions of listeners, and they would buy the. Pro I dare you tell me how many automobile commercials were on the last yeah, Super Bowl. That's right. How many mm -hmm. beers were added, and mm -hmm. so on and so on. It's a shame, but that's the economy we live in. I guess we really love radio, don't we? I do. I know you do. That's for sure. And I'm leaving a great heritage <laughs> in foundations. Yeah. I'm not just loving it. I've mm -hmm. created two foundations. One is at the University mm -hmm. of Georgia and one here in New York City. They're not-for-profit educational foundations. The money is not taxable. Uh, that is, it's tax-free mm -hmm. mm -hmm. when you donate to my foundation yes. mm -hmm. and the IRS has blessed me and so on but still I can't get through to the National Endowment for the Humanities I can't get through to the National Endowment for the Arts they simply have an executive group that don't accept or understand what I'm saying if I said a show has to cost twenty thousand dollars they say oh that that's yeah that makes sense but if I say it has to cost four thousand dollars, well, how is that possible? We need consultants, we need advisors, we need yeah. academ academicians. We know they'll add up to twenty-five thousand in seconds, and won't. And I cannot crook them. I don't know how. And the minute you work, you submit a budget that is honest. And I say this out on the air. I will challenge them and take their budget apart and let them take my budget apart for what I want to do. I truly, truly challenge the entire National Endowment for the Arts, and I'm a very, very healthy taxpayer. I speak from my gut. They may justify those huge sums because I've seen the budgets, mm -hmm. but in turn I will justify my budget, which can be maybe 20 or 25% of what they spend, and justify it with big names and very, very talented people without all the advisors and the counselors and the people they fly in and they put up and give God knows how much each day for their consultancy. And your audience will be larger than most of the things that they oh, do. Oh, you don't yeah. even... If I told you what they... They're mm -hmm. working, let's say there will be a one-hour version of, of uh, O'Neill's uh, Emperor Jones that... Uh, I, I, d don't start me on it because I, they, they'll probably bring me down and sue me I mean what difference yeah. it's one time yeah. I'm mm -hmm. talking about 52 weeks a yeah, year right. I'm yeah. talking of one hour two hours a night mm -hmm. that's the only way you establish this maybe it's a select audience it is Perhaps. a select audience but that's alright no, but that's they're not select they're that. intelligent yeah. they're creative mm -hmm. people they're people who want to change from whatever they're getting and I don't want to use the words that come to mind that what they're being fed on television and cable really you know I know we're all out of time <clears throat> we could spend another couple of hours talking about the, your career past and present but I want to thank you very much for spending this time with us and for coming to Chicago to participate in the activities at the Museum of Broadcast Communications and to thank you not only for all of the good things that you've done over the years on radio, but for so many of the great things you're still going to do on radio. Maybe we'll have some very special radio drama right here when you move to the new cultural center. I have every hope that Bruce Dumont, who is so active and so important in the museum, will be able to create what I want to do. I won't go into detail so that we can do it here, maybe once or twice a month, but it will be on a very, very special level. It's our dream, too. It's All right. Dream. Thank you very much, Hyman Thank you Brown. for having me.